So today we're going to talk about a takeoff partial engine power problem real close to my house. Uh, literally, it's like a half mile right over there, uh, just east of the runway. So stick with me on Flywire. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flyer, we're going to talk about the takeoff accident of the P210 7361 Kilo. This happened on uh, 21 June 2022 at my home airport of 50 Fox, and there are a bunch of important lessons uh, to learn from this accident, so stick around. Here's the setup. The airplane had reportedly had an engine replaced by a Cessna mechanic based here at 50 Fox just prior to this accident. There's no ADS-B record of the accident flight. Uh, we rarely have that low altitude here. We're kind of in a bowl at 50 Fox. So what I have for you are accounts from witnesses and first responders uh, and a little bit of the ADS-B record, so uh, previous flights. Looking at the flight record for the airplane, it looks like the first flight after the engine change was on 11 June, and this took place for 28 minutes and basically over circled overhead the field. Five, five days later, on 16 June, there was another flight on record for about five minutes, and this looks like pretty much a simple uh, trip around the pattern. Not quite an hour later, the airplane flies to Bridgeport, Texas. Uh, I'm betting this is a fuel stop for gas. Um, I've been there dozens and dozens of times, and sometimes it has the cheapest fuel around, and it does right now. Less than 30 minutes after this, the airplane landed at Bridgeport. It takes off again, this time for Wichita, Kansas. And this flight's for about an hour and a half. Less than three hours later, 61 Kilo is headed back to Borland Field, arriving just in just under two hours. So let's summarize the engine break-in procedure for a new turbocharged engine. Initial flight of less than a half hour overhead the field. That's good. Uh, that's more or less what I do. Uh, short, of, short flight, full power, and then land to check for oil leaks, security, uh, things like that. Sometimes I change the oil uh, and filter. Then five days later, uh, 61 Kilo goes up for another trip around the pattern of maybe eight minutes. This is a bit longer than I'm than this is normal, I think, but is what it is. And on that day, then it's off for a long cross-country trip with multiple stops. That's five flights for less than five hours. Typically, the ring should seat in about three hours or less. In all, uh, I guess it's not a bad profile for a break-in regimen with a turbocharged airplane. I'd say that good, maybe even common practice is to do sustained high power runs until the ring seat for an adequate break-in. Uh, for a normally aspirated airplane, that dictates low altitude. I want to get high pressure and high power. And uh, I do that overhead the field and circle overhead the field as a hedge against engine failure. For a turbocharged airplane, you really don't need to stay low to develop high power. So. Going cross country, that's a good way to do a sustained run uh, at altitude. The reports that I heard were that the accident flight was the third flight for the airplane. Okay, so get this, the, these are reports. According to the ADSB record, that does not appear to be the case uh, as evinced by the above uh, flight re review. Sometimes reports are inaccurate and given witness, and even witnesses sometimes don't even get the whole story. They get part of it and you have to put the pieces together. What happened on 21 June? Why did this engine not develop full power? Well, let's go back to the setup for this accident. There were four men in the airplane. <clears throat> it had full fuel, which as memory served for the 210 is about 120 gallons for the P210. It's a lot of gas, it's a lot of weight. Initial reports I heard were that the accident, and this was the third flight, and then the accident occurred in the afternoon with temps of about 100 degrees or so, and, well, the initial reports were wrong. They were exaggerated. When you dig into the facts, the airplane attempted to take off at 0840 in the morning with winds about 14 miles from the south and a temperature of about 87 degrees, device 100. So given that, I'd guess the DA is just a bit over 22,000, maybe 2,500, something like that. Not terrible conditions, okay? Not, not bad at all. Uh, not the third flight on a break-in, engine break-in. The P210 is pressurized and it's a heavy airplane. Add to that, that fuel, full load of fuel and four dudes, uh, who knows how heavy they are, one could say was probably pushing gross weight. Given the five break-in flights, one would also think that any issues with the engine would probably have been taken care of prior to this evolution. 
So it's hard to put your finger on what a likely scenario would be for this partial power loss takeoff. The ground track of this accident flight was takeoff roll on 50 Fox runway 17, followed by a turn at fairly low altitude to the east, and then it disappeared from the witnesses. This is an approximation of the ground track, given the assumption that at low altitude, heavy and slow, shallow bank angles were used to make that turn. Okay, and I think that's consistent with uh, the ground impact profile. A couple of things come to mind here, given the overhead picture and this video that I shot of the, from the Husky a couple of days later. It appears to me that the mindset of the pilot flying was an attempt to fly back to the runway. The Husky, as you can see, was in a downwind for the runway 17 when I flew over the airplane, and I like to fly a close-in downwind. It's a true statement. Uh, wide downwind for slow and low, that's probably not a bad call. And, but this airplane was obviously not making enough power to fly level, much less climb. So 100, 200 feet in the air or something like that, he disappeared pretty quickly. As we can see in the video here, this is a perfectly good field under the left wing. For me at 50 Fox, this particular field has always been my out in an engine failure, failure say, take, for the engine failure scenario taking off from runway 17. There is a considerable hill on the south side of the runway, lots of trees. Not exactly inviting, no good place to land until you get over that top of that hill and past it. So I think this speaks to the mindset of the pilot. He did not consider a forced landing. His intention was to re return to one, runway 17 period. Well, that would have been a nice thing to have happened. But what really happened evinces a total misreading of the energy state of the airplane, possible outcomes, and an unsupport and unsupported wishful thinking. I want to make it back to the runway. Frankly, this is the kind of thinking that kills people. In this particular accident, no one was hurt. No one was seriously injured. That is an incredible, fortunate thing. The airplane went through the trees on that border of the field with the gear still down. Okay. Uh, the nose gear was broken off. The, one of the main gear was broke, uh, also broken and remained in the trees, and the other one was broken. Um, and pieces of the wing were still in the trees. The airplane impacted hard on the field and it broke the engine mounts but remained upright. And it did not break the uh, fuel cells. There was no fire. Lucky, lucky, lucky. It is still in the field as I post this video. Indeed, they were lucky, okay? A successful outcome, survival-wise, was not intentional in this case. There, were, there was a perfectly good field to land in, improving the chances of survive, survivability, and maybe even saving the airplane for future use. Who knows? That's not the priority. But that was not considered an option. Arguably, it might have been a good idea to re retract the gear, perhaps, uh, and suppose that then I was told that the, about 10 degrees ish, 10 to 20 percent flaps were on the airplane as well. I'll leave that on the table. Okay, um, that was one of the responders that told me that. The mindset was that this airplane is an airplane and I'm happy in it and it's going to fly me back to the airport. I think this is an important lesson to be learned from this accident. You have to think about this and prepare for this problem on the ground. Trying to figure this out in the air for the first time could be a fatal choice. And, and I think in this accident was very close to being a fatal choice for all four. I'm sure you're still thinking about what was the cause of this partial power loss on takeoff. I know I am. I spoke to the, the first, uh, first responder who assisted the crew and the passengers out of the airplane and secured the scene. He said the accident airplane had actually attempted a takeoff just prior uh, to this incident and uh, it aborted the takeoff because the engine was not making enough power. The pilot then taxied back and attempted to take off again with the resulting uh, crash in the field. Trying that same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome, is not a path to success. I could wax more lyrical on that, but that's the nice way of putting it. The first responder I spoke with is a pilot, and he inspected the cockpit after securing the scene and noticed the location of all the switches. The Prop plates were bent, of evidence of the engine making some power on impact, and the switches, all the switches were set for flight. He could not shut off the fuel valve. Uh, he's worried about a fuel leak. He's a firefighter. 
most likely to, this is related to the broken engine mount. He did note that the air conditioning switches were on, not off. The air conditioning system in most of these light GA airplanes has a belt-driven compressor that saps the engine of power, considerable power. And I would imagine that the pressurization system has the same. Lots of power to run those two systems. The checklists are written to ensure that the AC is turned off before takeoff. You don't really need it. You need the power instead. This apparently was not the case in this partial power loss on takeoff accident. I'm a big believer in flows developed from a detailed checklist. If I haven't flown a particular airplane in a while, I'm going to take my time and I'm going to go through the checklist item by item until I'm comfortable. That may be one flight, maybe a dozen, who knows. I suspect that checklist usage was a factor in this accident. Uh, especially on that second one, didn't catch it. There are a few things, I think, that quite a few things that I think we can learn from this accident that I'm going to talk about three mainly. One is, again, for me, the biggest under, is the understanding that the energy state in your airplane and you need to accept when you don't have enough to stay airborne. Be prepared for an off airport landing. Have thought all that through so when you hit a gate, a trigger gate, uh, I know what to do here instead of, I need to think about what to do, because you don't think under stress. People don't do that. Number two, next comes checklist usage and understanding your airplane. Bottom line, got to know the systems and you got to respect them. Number three, finally, if there's something wrong with the performance of your airplane, there is usually a reason for that to have happened. Find that reason or don't attempt to commit aviation. That's my nickel. Why bet on your life for this? And think the outcome is going to be different. One more observation is that first reports are almost always wrong and there is usually more to the story than it first appears. So sometimes it's better to wait a little while for the truth well out. Uh, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters here and if you'd like to support the channel I'll leave a link below uh, in the description and if you'd like to subscribe it, it looks a bit like this here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Flywire.